the the um, human rights have been a very important uh, part on on uh, we have a standing committee on human rights here at the academy, and uh, I've been a member of that uh, committee way before I got involved in, in, in the board of government and. And because of my other interest at the National Academy, I've also been involved in human rights. So this is, I think, close to my heart, and I think it's something that we in science is are very, very concerned about freedom of speech. And that uh, since we couldn't function as scientists if we didn't have the right to speak freely. Uh, and uh, as you know, this is in some instances have been difficult for individuals to so and we have uh, we have um, a committee as I said and the chairman of, of the committee is Ruth Herman who is here and he will uh, present awards every year we give a award uh, 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 called Heinz Pegel Award uh, to, uh, uh, to, and, uh, to uh, individuals uh, who have been particularly uh, deserved directly and um, so I will now ask uh, our chair of the committee to come forward and make the presentation. Thank you, Thank you Uh It's really been my pleasure to have done this uh, task for a number of years. And uh, today uh, will be my last stand up here. I'll say some remarks about that afterwards. But if those of you uh, would like to understand a bit of the past of the Human Rights Award, known as the Pagels Prize, uh, please turn to the next to the last page of the material that you've got. And if you get a glance down the list of award, past awardees, uh, I think some of the names will stand out uh, to you. Uh, and so, uh, again, glancing at the list, you'll notice that the uh, majority of the awardees of the Pagels Prize are individuals, scientists, who themselves suffer repression in one way or another uh, from their government. And we have recognized that often while these individuals were still either in prison or under some form of detention. Uh, uh, and I'll say more about that later. A certain uh, fraction of the awardees have been persons who either in the United States or uh, France or Canada have shown extraordinary dedication and over-the-top uh, concentration on helping those repressed scientists in countries around the world. And today, uh, it's my privilege to present two awardees uh, who are in the second category. Uh, and I will ask them to come forward one at a time uh, after I read uh, a bit about them. Now, uh, I'll first talk about uh, Dr. Zafra Lehrman, who is a chemist who is here. Uh, Zafra has devoted extraordinary energy in mobilizing the chemists in the United States and the American Chemical Society to a sensitivity of uh, the importance of attending to human rights of individuals around the world. Not just chemists, nor physicists, but scientists, and sometimes others around the world. Zafra, uh, who you'll hear in just one moment, uh, is easily recognized by not only uh, her beauty, but the force of her personality when she explains to you uh, the kind of motivation that she's had through the years. I think that today's awardees of the Pegasus Prize, uh, of whom, as I say, there are two, and I'll call Zafra up in just one second, are in many ways role models that we in this committee would like to show as the face of human rights. Active, active, active scientists who are doing their own uh, work in their scientific field and for whom the agenda of human rights is right up there with getting their names on publications in the top journals in their field. So now I'd like to call on Zafra Lerman to come forward. And I would like to present Zafra 
with this award. First, first I'll read the citation and then uh, present it to her. The 2005 Heinz Pagels Award of the uh, New York Academy of Sciences presented to Zafra Lerman for her effective and tireless work on behalf of dissident scientists throughout the world and in particular her groundbreaking efforts in the Middle East. So, Zafra. Okay. Thank you very much. I was very worried. I did not see my grandchildren. They just arrived. So hi, Daniel and Ben. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> now I can relax and uh, say a few for it. First, I would like to extend my thanks to the New York Academy of Sciences for honoring me with the highest pay in the world for human rights for scientists. I am proud to be in the company of past award recipients, Andrei Sakharov, Fang Liji, Alexander Nikitin, Vilna Zainov, just to name a few, all of whom happen to be scientists on whose behalf I have worked very hard. I must also thank the American Chemical Society, which has sponsored my human rights work and provided me with a powerful voice to benefit humankind. And there are a few members of the American Chemical Society here. Thank you for coming. And also to Columbia College Chicago, which has been extremely supportive of my human rights work over the years, and they are sitting on the other side as representative. I'd like to take a minute to address the commitment and responsibility of scientists, and this is my new project with support for the American Chemical Society toward peace in the Middle East. Five years ago, I brought in front of the American Chemical Society board the idea to bring together top scientists who have influence on the representative government from 10 Middle East countries to work and collaborate together on issues of common concern to all. In order to get the scientists to meet with each other, as well as with Israeli scientists, I offered them the opportunity to meet and interact with six Nobel laureates for five days with a very high ratio of participants around every Nobel laureate. When December 5, 2003 arrived, I was shaking to see how many of the scientists would actually show up and how assistant they might be to talk to each other. The reality of the situation was an eye-opener. The conference looked more like a family reunion than people from diverse countries and cultures who typically do not communicate or peacefully interact. Every participant realized that they share the common language with each other, science, and that the similarities which we all share were far more numerous and significant than the differences that divided us. Many collaborations started during the conference and many more came out of the cross-border association that were initiated on the island of Malta. At the conclusion of the conference, there was a unanimous agreement to hold the second conference. Malta II, as we are calling it, will be double the size of the first conference, again the lead by the American Chemical Society. We have added three Middle East countries to the mix and are already anxious about what will happen. In Malta I, we were concerned if the people who were invited will show up. For Malta II, we have had to turn people away. We already have people signed on for a potential Malta III conference, including Nobel laureates and the musician Daniel Bernboim that offered to bring his um, <coughs> Middle East Orchestra to Malta III. I'm distributing, and my people have it here, copies of the permanent congressional record which contains a speech that the Illinois Senator did they are being made from the floor of the U.S. Senate regarding the first Malta conference. This will provide you with more information. Again, thank you for honoring me. Thank you all. Thank you. This year, we 
recommended to the board, and the board uh, of governors of the academy agreed the uh, two worthy candidates. The second one, uh, Professor Herman Winnick, a professor like uh, Zafra uh, in physics. Uh, I can say some words about his unusual activities through the years. He has been deputy director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator, SLAC, as it's known. He's now emeritus. And a number of years ago, he conceived also a project of bringing scientists in the Middle East together, people who under normal circumstances would not be allowed by their various governments to talk to one another. And Herman <coughs> has been the engine behind the creation of what is called the Sesame Project that has come to fruition in the Middle East. It's an ongoing and hands-on activity where scientists from all region, all countries in the region uh, meet, work together, they go into the lab together, and they do, we believe, first-class publishable results. We'll look for it in FISREV letters as their work matures. But not only that, uh, Professor Winnick Herman, actually along with Zafra, have very recently taken a specific interest in saving one human being. There is in the uh, Jewish law a statement that he or she who saves a single human being saves the human race. Now this individual who has uh, <coughs> been nurtured, saved, is an Iranian physicist, of all things, an Iranian physicist, and as recently as this morning, uh, it was uncertain whether this person, Professor Hadzaida, would be permitted to continue his temporary stay in the United States while his family hopefully uh, is allowed to join him here. Through the terrific efforts of Herman, and I must say others, including Zafra, uh, the word we got today was a real cliffhanger, cliffhanger is that uh, Professor Hadzaida's stay in the U.S. has been extended. We hope that during this extension, his family will join him and that he can stay here. He, Hadzaida, a former winner of the Pagels Prize, got it because he was one of the intellectuals in Iran who signed a statement pro-democracy. Not to overthrow the government, but just pro-democracy. And he was clamped in prison and uh, suffered greatly. Now, in view of this uh, series of accomplishments over a long time, uh, the Academy is going to present to uh, Herman Winnick this uh, citation. I'd like to read the 2005 Hans Pagels Human Rights of Scientists Award to Herman Winnick for his effective and tireless work on behalf of dissident scientists throughout the world, particularly Iran. Herman? Thank you. So I'll ask you, Herman, to please say some words. Thank you so much, Joe. It's, of course, a great honor to receive this from this august body. Uh, like Safra, I'm honored and awed to be included in the ranks of people that Joe indicated on the back page there, uh, particularly since so many of them have championed human rights, as I have, but at great risk to themselves, uh, particularly people like Professor Hadiza Day that Joe mentioned and others. I have to say it was a transforming event for me when I learned about the imprisonment of Professor Hadiza Day. I've been working and championing uh, the cause of many others, Sakharov, Olaf, Sharansky. I didn't know these people, although actually I met Olaf once in 1969 briefly. But here was a case of a person, a scientist, Professor Hadizadeh, that I had been working with on this Sesame project for several years. A person I respected and knew as a scientist and someone who um, latched on to the Sesame project because he wanted to promote science, technology, peace, and understanding in Iran and in the Middle East. And I respected him greatly for that. 
And when I learned suddenly that he was in prison, it was, as I say, a transforming event for me. I got into high gear to try to get him out, uh, worked with Joe Svetlana in the New York Academy, people in the National Academy, American Physical Society, Amnesty International, a huge barrage of letters to the Iranian government uh, pleading for his release. Uh, I like to think that these letters were effective, we never know uh, what caused his release. He was released, uh, and I, I hope our letters and campaign uh, were uh, an element in that. Uh, and, but then they uh, issued another, they had hearings and issued another sentence of eight years and nine months of additional prison time. That meant we had to get him out of Iran and out of danger. <clears throat> so we got letters signed, uh, uh, among others, by Torsten Wiesel and 32 other Nobel laureates to, uh, to get him out. And he is out now working at Ohio University. His contract ran out, and he surprisingly announced to me just a few days ago that he would leave October 2nd to go back to Iran because part of his family is there. His contract was running out. I hadn't realized it was that close. His visa still has another month to go. Anyway, we got into high gear. I was in Italy, and other key people were in France. We communicated with email and phone calls in a frantic few days, uh, which were successful. And now he has a year extension during which time, as Joe said, we are going to work hard to uh, reunite him with his family uh, and get him a long-term job. That's our next task, Joe. Right. Um, I'd like to <coughs> also comment that um, whatever instincts I have in promoting human rights and helping others, uh, I have to attribute to my parents. Um, as a young boy, I remember my mother and father who fled um, Tsarist Russia almost 100 years ago, fortunately, waiting for the Holocaust. They came 100 years ago. And their house, uh, they fled uh, um, poverty, disease, persecution, pogroms, uh, to start a new life in this country. And I'm the beneficiary of that. But I always remember how our home was open to less fortunate people, lots of them from their villages back in Russia and others and how my mother for many years uh, would make packages of new clothing to send to her family back in Russia. These were examples that I think are um, examples for me and perhaps in my genes. And I'm grateful that several of my nieces, nephews, the grandchildren of my parents are here to share this honor with me because I think that they also have this in their genes. So we've had a bit of a family reunion here, a family and friends from Florida to Massachusetts and New Jersey who have come here. And it's a pleasure to see them again, and I urge them to think about the example of their grandparents. Thank you very much.